This is Tim Myers. Thanks for seeing me. You better walk off camera here. <laughs> I quickly wanted to go over the history of the place. I guess the name was it was named Caberfay back in 1919, 1937. People started skiing here with uh, I think they had some kind of tow rope. 1939, the ski club started it uh, more officially. 1982 is when you guys came to the scene. Your dad, I guess. Yeah, and his brothers. 16 tow ropes, six T bars, and two cheerless. So, you guys got it from the bank after the club had already lost it. Correct. So the club fostered the place for a long time. They couldn't really make a profit. It was obviously a huge scattered place. So there's a little bit of there's a little bit of ownership history in there. So that that was run by a board of directors, owned by the Forest Service, run by a board of directors for many years. And then in the, I believe it sometime in the '60s, like in the mid '60s, later '60s, they wanted to put in uh, chairlifts. They wanted to put in some more um, infrastructure so that the original number one and bow buck chairs were put in. And in order to do that, they sold stock. The the board that was running the place sold stock and people bought shares of stock and somewhere along the way one person bought the majority of that stock and then became the owner and that's how it went from being publicly held uh, not for profit run by a board to being privately owned was once they issued the stock somebody bought the majority and then he owned it. So then that owner had it like from the late 60s through the 70s and then it, it went bankrupt under him right around 80, 81 and that's when, uh, when, when we got involved. So that's how, it that's how it happened, that's how it transitioned. And then um, the two brothers bought it, your father and his cousin or his brother? Uh, was, yeah, yep, there was actually three of them to begin and then, and then, uh, and then now there's the two of them, yep. And the new generation took over you and uh, your cousin? My cousin Pete, yes. Pete. Love him, he's a nice guy. I noticed I saw a big, of course you don't know about this, I saw a Big M Caberfay season pass that someone had posted online. So apparently they had control of that hill too. So back in the, the back, club. yeah, back in the, you know, again, I don't know, wouldn't know the, what decade, if it was the 60s or the 70s, but when Big M was still around, the, the, they were both on Forest Service property. And I'm not sure who ran Big M or how they were affiliated, but I do know that the number six T-bar, the Hall T-bar, came from Big M when it closed. Do you have any idea when they closed? I, I don't. I don't know that year. I don't know that. It's a neat hill, but not very tall. Okay, so then you guys built the South Peak after you took over. That would be your father built it right yeah it, yep and his brother and i guess the backcountry wasn't getting used so much so that started getting abandoned yes as the years went by and there's a jim neff article at michiganskier.com that has a lot of details on the history of the place that's the best history i've read because that takes you right from the right from the beginning right up to it was updated as early i think it was updated last year so that is if you really want the history that's the what that's the best one Okay, I wanted to go into a lift tech a little bit. I asked this last time, but I think it got lost on the take. Uh, cost of running old versus new. Is it compared to like the riblet lift and this lift? How big of a difference is there in cost of running them? Yeah, it, the, it is definitely more expensive to keep the older lifts running than it is to run the new lifts as far as um, the efficiency, you know, the for, like on the electricity, um, how dialed in the drives and the motors are on the new lifts compared to, you know, what we what we had, you know, in the early 80s. Not that it's bad, but, but the new stuff is more efficient. And it, But the big thing is the maintenance. You know, on the older equipment, your line work, um, you know, you're just, you're changing a lot more shivs. You're having to go, you know, drop shiv trains down, um, replace axles, replace bushings. You know, just do a lot more line work that takes time. Um, and, and with the newer equipment, you certainly have to do that stuff on your preventative maintenance cycles, but you're, you're using a really, you know, Stoppelmeyer lifts are really well built, really good at, solid equipment and it seems to just run and run so you know we do our maintenance but 
We're not having to do a lot of replacing, at least not yet. Um, Vista has run for six years and we've changed one shift wheel. And so it's just been a really, you know, it's just, it doesn't take nearly as long and the maintenance costs are way down. So the new equipment, you know, there's the big outlay up front, of course, to go new, but your maintenance costs are, are way down and your the skier, it's a much nicer ride. Uh, very quiet, very, very um, smooth, comfortable chairs. Uh, so the customers like it better too. The skiers like it better. Well, you've got your old riblet running pretty quietly, I noticed, as compared to some of the riblets I've seen. <laughs> the, the, the riblet's in great shape. We take great care of it, and it, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Um, but it just it takes more maintenance. It takes more time, more TLC in the summertime to keep that lift running as well as it does. So it appears to me that the uh, riblet is the only one that has open bearings on the shows. Is that true? Uh, y yeah, I believe, yes, yes. So they need more grease and more maintenance just for, yes. for that. you go through more bearings over there for sure, yes. I just noticed the cement use in the bottom station and top. I guess it makes sense, cement's uh, strong in compression and they're mostly in compression in top and bottom. I just wonder if you have any thoughts about cement. Well, I sure like it. Uh, these these terminals using the you know you pour your footing and then you have your your uh, your big uh, pillar or mast as the lift company calls it uh, comes up out of the out of the middle and that's full of steel re rebar and then you pour your concrete and you have your anchor bolt templates and that goes in there and it I think it's a really nice way to build a lift. Uh, in the bottom station and the top station using quite a bit of cement instead of just all steel for the structure of the lift itself. So if you do move a lift that's built that way you have to you wouldn't move the cement you would just you'd have to report it. You'd just redo it. You'd redo it, yep. And that's like a high tech cement I would imagine. It's uh it's 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 not a high tech cement but it's definitely the concrete has to uh, it has to pass a uh, brake test of forty five hundred PSI after twenty eight days. So that's how strong it needs to be so that's uh you know pretty strong concrete now we did our our uh, con our tests and and they were breaking at way way higher pressure than that so this concrete is very well done and okay. it should last forever now i was wondering about how the brand was chosen now i know that you had the riblet and riblet sold a lot of their stuff to c tech when they closed so it's kind of a progression i guess in your companies and then c tech Duffmeyer got some piece of SeaTac, I thought. Yeah, so Riblet was never part of SeaTac. Riblet was just its own thing, and then they they stopped making lifts, I think, in the early '90s. But SeaTac bought a bunch of their inventory when they closed. Mm. That's what I read, anyway. Maybe, maybe that's the case. <laughs> that could be. Uh, but SeaTac then, SeaTac was a big company making a lot, building a lot of lifts in the '80s and in the '90s, and then I and then at some point. I don't know if it was the late 90s or early 2000s, they they, um, they merged with Doppelmeyer. So oh, it's Doppelmeyer SeaTech. And then, so we have the SeaTech Quad, which is an excellent lift and uh, really a great lift and it will probably last uh, many, many more years. And then we've moved to Doppelmeyer, uh, you know, once when we started putting new lifts in. So I was wondering about the choice of Duffmeyer. Was it automatic because of, of the sequence, sort of, or did you really think about it in terms of reliability and costs, or, or are you able to like get one guy against the other guy and say Duffmeyer is going to do it for this? What can you do, Mr. Powell? Well, we, you know, we we definitely got quotes from other um, companies, and we looked at, you know, get, you know, researched and looked at it, and and the other companies are excellent too. They make a great product. They all make really high end you know top-notch products so it wasn't that wasn't the issue at all we really like Doppelmeyer's design we really like the way Doppelmeyer laid the laid the towers out the way they did it um, that's what really attracted the, us to it when we did Vista we really liked the design the engineers from Doppelmeyer came up with a really great design that we really liked and then after we did that lift we just forged a great relationship with them and and have have stuck with them and uh, obviously they've been working with you well or you wouldn't be dealing with them now in terms of uh, service and stuff yeah top notch top notch they help us they help us all the time and I can't say enough good things about the company and, and I really like uh, partnering with them 
Okay, moving on to the future. You said one time, pinned you down here, <laughs> and I know anything in the future, future plans are all targets. They're not laid in stone because you want to see how things work out and kind of move organically. Uh, but you said something about using Bo Bucklift bottom station and then going up Bullnose clearing um, and maybe putting a hall there. Yeah, we, we, we want to expand in the future. Um, I, we're not sure what the lift would be at this time. Um, you know, we want to, we, we plan and hope to expand that direction. But again, like you just said, it takes time. We move cautiously. Um, but we have to see what the, what the world does, what does the weather do, you know, all those things. So we don't know, you know, that's the goal, but we don't know for sure what, what will happen. Are you still going to be reshaping and adding to East Peak? We will continue to do that. Okay, that's what I figured, because that one side looks like you got to do something with it. Now, I heard something about a run around the back side of East Peak. Is that going to happen? I don't think there's any absolute plans to do that. I mean, we talk about different things like that, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if that will ever happen or not. Okay, because I was hearing about a lift, uh, run going around the whole East Peak and then towards the back and then going in between North and South Peak, it would dump out. Yeah, I'm not sure... Who, where are you hearing that? <laughs> I was just wondering what kind of ideas you got in the fire. Well, we certainly kick around a lot of different ideas for moving Earth and, and where we might go and what we might do. But, but uh, you know, whether that'll ever happen, um, it, it just time will tell. Now, I've noticed you took a lot of the dirt away from what was the old ridge. And you kind of cleared, by removing all that dirt and moving it up here, you've cleared that big area so you can see the hills behind that ridge sort of so it could I was just wondering if there was a strategy in the long run or if, if you're trying to open that area up to this to the whole area or um, I'm not sure where you're looking there I'm not not quite sure what you're talking about okay um, well let's see you had the old tow rope on the ridge and you had the uh, instructor tow rope that uh, that went parallel to it rather and they that stopped at a certain point and then you carved out what used to be the rest of that ridge kind of gone beyond that little hill I mean is it, you talk about where we're getting the dirt from right now yeah yeah there the there's no real strategy for for development over there it's just where we're taking the the sand from um, that has a lot to do with having the volume of sand that we want and the proximity to where we're moving it so the you know the, the shorter the trip the more efficient you move it um, what I what I think will happen is when we're all done digging back there we'll we'll kind of bend that down you know we'll bend that cliff down um, you know we'll, we'll recontour it and then we'll fill it with trees we'll plant a ton of trees in there and make a forest huh. you know so it'll look it'll look like it'll look natural in 30 years it'll look like it was always like that because with that ridge gone now you kind of over it up to the peaks and back I was kind of wondering if that was a strategy no, not at this time. That's getting pretty. That's getting pretty far out there, and and uh, getting to be a pretty big footprint. And I'm not sure we're ever going to go there. Want to go that <laughs> far? So moving on to miscellaneous here. Um, Millsap, you've probably heard of them. The people who look at the old the, uh, Michigan Lost Ski Area Project. Oh, okay. And I know you gave some parts to Mount Mancelona, or sold them, or gave them. I've kind of been watching their efforts, hopefully. hopefully. Do you know anything at all about Sugarloaf and what happened there and who the owners are and what the secrets are and what's going to happen? I don't know anything about what's going on at Sugarloaf. You know, I, I dig in probably like you do, try to find stuff on, on, uh, on the Internet, and, and uh, it just doesn't seem to be much movement up there. I think maybe I heard they tore the lodge down. and um, I don't honestly don't out. think there's much infrastructure left there anymore. No. I think pretty mo what's pretty well cleaned up. Uh, I do know it's a great hill, great hill, beautiful area. Um, I skied, raced there, in, you know, in the 80s uh, as a as in high school, and it's an awesome place. So I, like you, I I don't know anything, but I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it come back someday. And then I just have some other odd items. Then I have some concerns. I see Boeing is pulling out their riblets and putting in huge monster lifts. And I guess that makes sense if you can pull out three lifts and put one lift in its place, which you don't really have that circumstance here. Were you considering a six when you did uh, North Peak? We were, we really were never considering a six. Um, you know, one of the things about those lifts is they, the, 
the uh, terminals are huge, you know, the bottom and the top terminals. And we really don't even have the space at the top, especially, for a terminal that large. You know, that would just take up the whole top. There you and there'd be nowhere for the skiers to go. So you'd have <laughs> all those skiers getting off of a lift and nowhere to stand. So, and and the other thing is that, you know, there's a, there's a lot out there on the internet now. There's a really good uh, YouTube video that Matt Sobranski did about, you know, a, a fixed grip versus a detachable in the Midwest. And uh, they just don't, the fixed grips make sense for us and detachables really don't, not for Cabra Fay. This, what we're doing makes sense for us. I see you using more LEDs for lighting, but I was just wondering how you guys are doing with that. I saw you had a couple that were failing. Yeah, so, so the, you know, the, the LED is definitely the way we're moving, but we haven't found a product that's really holding up. You can see how there's, there's sections of them that are failing. So I'm kind of not sure what to do there right now, I'm trying to figure lighting out. But the old metal halides, they're kind of a thing of the past, and it's moving to LED. But it seems like LED in the sports lighting world might might still need some time to get perfected. So I, we're kind of caught in a quandary trying to figure out which what to do, you know, moving forward. Yeah, the cob type of emitter will be more reliable for you. But the real thing is the driver circuit that they all have. And if you buy a cheap Chinese lamp, then they just they just don't put much quality into the driver circuit. And they only last a year or two. Okay. I had some little minor concerns, complaints here, but. The lift line uh, off the path there, I showed that one of my videos, it's really tough to get to that run. There's a lot of sticks laying down. So yeah, we it. made it tough on purpose because we don't really want you to go down there. <laughs> <laughs> so so good, I'm glad it's tough to get in there. <laughs> and then home, Homeburg Glade right outside of it, it's a nice loose clade, but there's a lot of sticks laying in it, so you really can't use it. Okay, so maybe that just needs a little cleanup then. Yeah. Yeah. And my other little complaint, I don't know what you can do about it, is, uh, and it wasn't bad last year at all, the racers like to take over South Peak completely and just leave one little trail down the middle of the one run. There's uh, only there's only a couple of races a year where we where we do that. So there's a there's a race, um, just trying to think here, uh, there's a race uh, the last Friday of January every year. That's the Greater Grand Rapids Ski Conference race. We've been doing it for, you know, 20 years. Yeah, and those people are pretty nice. And they're nice, and they come up, and it, and they do a high school race, and we definitely tie up Liberty and the dark side for that. So really, Charlie's the only thing to ski on that day. But you know it's going to be the last Friday in January. And then every other year, we we host the regional, the high school regional. And when we usually when it's worse. And last <laughs> last year we we hosted a, re, a regional. This year we're not hosting a regional, so that won't be an issue. Um, you're you're one one day a year usually, and it's the la, it's just mark it down on your calendar. The last Friday in January we're going to have that race that that Greater Grand Rapids uh, High School race, and and South Peak's going to be tied up in the morning. When you get the big regional one here, and a lot of those kids have to come down from up north, you know, and they don't really want to be here. I was going to also bring up is, uh, I mean, the last two years wasn't an issue because you kind of started on a Friday and gave us weekday people at least one day there and then started your season right up. So you didn't have any protected, pr protracted periods where you were open for weekends only. I mean, you haven't done that last two years. And hopefully. That's all weather-based. So, you know, when what we we will we will be in it it lot has to do with snowmaking. So the the reason the, for the midweek shutdowns like in the first half of December are mainly snowmaking. So we can just make snow and not have it's when when you when you marry the two, when you're trying to marry snowmaking and skiing, it's difficult and it and it compromises both things, right? The skiing's not as good and the snowmaking's not as good. So early season when we've got to get this when we got to get that snow made, we'll close down during the week so that we can make snow. And then mid by mid December we'll start running stuff in for the skiers. So we, we will run weekends only uh, through the through the middle of this, through about the middle mid December. And then we'll run weekends only after the third Sunday in March. So that's, you know, so if when you're buying your pass and you're deciding on, you know, if you're going to do the midweek or you want to do the peak pass, you should consider that it'll be weekends only 
until the middle of December and it's going to be weekends only after the third Sunday in March. So that's a consideration that you should make if you're buying a midweek pass. Okay, and that hasn't been an issue the last two years because you pretty much closed, I mean, opened on a Friday and then uh, closed without a big extended period. But um, I'm just wondering, as a midweek guy, and a Friday and then one of those weekends. Well, that really, that really, you know, that really devalues the, the peak pass and the weekend pass. So it's, you know, we have, we have a midweek product and we have a weekend product and we have a peak product. So but if you want those, if you want those Saturdays, <laughs> you got to buy that peak product. Like that's just, or you got to buy the, the uh, weekend pass. That's just, but I think if you look at the other ski areas in northern Michigan and even southern Michigan and look at our our pass prices, oh, you're great. not going to find a better deal. No, they're you're, great. You're not going to find a better deal. And actually today is September 30th, so this is the last day to buy the pass at the lowest rate. Tomorrow it'll go up a little bit and we'll continue to climb as we go into the winter. So yeah, people really need to jump on that in the summers and uh save themselves some money. I mean, I skied, what, 22 times here last year, I think, and divide that by 160 bucks, I'm skiing pretty cheap. You, you sure are. <laughs> you sure are. Are you going to do anything with this area where the two old lifts were? Are you going to reshape that, pull those en out? And I'm kind of wondering about this whole top end. It seems like something could be done to change the traffic now that you don't need to be curling around. I just wonder if you gave that any thought. Well, there's a, there's an awful lot of concrete in there between those two um, terminals. So I don't think that we'll be taking that concrete out of the ground, but we at some point, and it, we just didn't get there this year, we had too many things to do, uh, but we're gonna take down you know, most of the lift towers from the old lifts, and then we'll do, be doing a little bit of, of uh, reshaping up there to kind of widen that out. So that is in the plans. We just didn't get to it this year. It'll probably happen next year. But it's still gonna flow through there now a lot nicer than it ever has because you won't have traffic up there. You're getting some good information, man. You're getting, yeah. asking good questions. Good. And, yeah, <laughs> I think you're getting good info. Well, I, you know, like I said before, I- Not that anybody watches me, but-, but uh, <laughs> Instead of, re you know, instead of repeating bad information, Careful. Might as well, yeah. Get the good, get the good. I try to be as straight with you as I can. There are certain things we don't know, so I don't want to say too much, like about future development. We just don't know, you know. It's like we might do that. I don't. 